Okay, so did it, so let me just paste, copy paste that form just one more time so that the newcomer can also see that. All right, that's the form and all right. So let's begin the presentation. Um, as per the schedule, team one, could you start sharing your screen and begin with the presentation? Yes. Uh, hi, uh, I'd like to present uh, our team project uh, called Prediction of Medical Code from Clinical Text. Uh, our team members are Song Ju Won, Won Mo Ku, Bun uh, Su Han, and me. Um, our interest uh, is uh, in uh, clinical notes as a data set. Uh, no, a patient visits a hospital and shows uh, the patient symptom to a clinician, and the clinician uh, writes down description as a form of a uh, clinical note. Uh, so we expect that uh, we be, uh, a lot of patients visits the hospital, so therefore we also uh, have uh, numerous numbers of uh, clinical notes. So. Um, it is, it is uh, very important uh, to uh, identify the patient status from, uh, from the previous, from the previous uh, hospital to uh, next, previous, uh, next hospital. Here, a uh, patient visit the hospital one first, and then the clinician there uh, wrote down like uh, this patient had previously uh, has uh, sepsis. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this patient comes due to the diabetes. So the clinician in the hospital one recommended taking regular exercises uh, to the patient. So uh, maybe a, a patient is uh, taking a regular exercise, but uh, if it, the patient has some trouble again, and then visited a new one, new hospital, and the clinician in a new hospital two uh, uh, may be able to uh, read the uh, critical notes from the ho hospital one. So meaning that uh, uh, this patient's already taking regular exercise, but uh, still has a trouble like uh, high blood sugar. So, so this uh, leads uh, the clinician in hospital to, to uh, make sort of uh, another treatment, uh, except uh, taking uh, exercise. Uh, but, Unfortunately, um, there are uh, reliability issues of uh, clinical notes because um, every single clinical note is written by a different person. And even I uh, know that the clinical notes may be written in by hand or there is uh, input by computer. But anyway, um, these uh, uh, so clinical notes have irrelevant information or misspellings or non-standard uh, abbreviation because you know we know that the humans make errors. <laughs> so, in order to solve those problems in the uh, introduced in the previous slide, uh, we uh, want to build a model that uh, extract medical codes. Uh, automatically from a given clinical text. So we define this problem as a prediction of medical code from a clinical text. And we, uh, we want, uh, want to use uh, make uh, full advantage of the, the advance of the technology called natural language understanding because uh, it's uh, one of the mainstream research topic in the area of the deep learning now. And then um, uh, so thanks to the uh, great performance of the deep learning, and uh, so we expect uh, NLU works uh, better than uh, the, the human spaniel effort. So in our project, uh, we try to um, apply the state-of-art uh, NLU model uh, to our task, prediction of medical code from clinical text. So we have uh, documents uh, consisting of our words or suburbs, and then we give 
that as an input to our uh, annual model. And the model so predicts uh, the medical code uh, may I uh, used in the documents. So here, like uh, 358.61 is uh, true. So, so we predict this, this medical code is used in a uh, document. Or uh, 00901 is false, mean, means that uh, this code is not used in the, our, the, in the input document. So um, we actually uh, in, uh, so investigate um, uh, papers uh, about our task. And then the sort of the, this one is sort of baseline of our uh, research. It's a convolutional tension for multi-label classification. Also, uh, we uh, just you're saying camel uh, was produced, uh, proposed uh, to uh, solve the exact same, uh, uh, same problem or uh, to do the same task uh, as ours. <laughs> So this model uh, extract local features, uh, local features from servers with CNN and uses attention mechanism to global or make uh, global features. And instead of using just uh, softmax, uh, this model outputs uh, L by one laser logic where the L is the number of medical codes. And then uh, loss of the one logic is calculated by uh, binary cross entropy loss. Uh, and then uh, also there are um, some attempts to improve uh, the performance uh, uh, apart from Camel. So multi filter uh, residual convolutional net neural network also was produced uh, for uh, ICD coding. And then this model improved two things. The first one is uh, they add, uh, added a multi-filter conversion layer to capture uh, various lengths of text patterns with uh, yeah, different lengths. And the second one is they also added a residual conversion layer to enlarge the sort of uh, the receptive field, meaning that they uh, try to sort of add more flexibility. And there are also some uh, uh, other attempts, or there's some attempts like uh, multi-view convolutional and description regularized label dependent attention uh, was uh, uh, sort of produced, um, uh, proposed to uh, like use um, multi-view CNN channels and label dependent attention layers tuned to label descriptions. Uh, it is noticeable that uh, they used uh, all the clinical nodes instead of just using uh, discharge summaries uh, like CAMEL. Uh, uh, we also uh, uh, want to mention uh, this, con uh, this technology, uh, further pre-training. Uh, so, uh, it means that pre-training a language model uh, pseudo for a specific domain. Uh, so this uh, leads uh, performance gains under both large and small domain specific corpora. And then also uh, several studies already uh, proven that this uh, advantage of further predict training on many domains like uh, biomedical or movie reviews. And then there are, okay, uh, there are three uh, further pre-training approaches. And so within uh, task pre-training, the first one is uh, uh, using the data st uh, training set uh, from a given task. The second one is in-domain pre-training uh, is uh, using uh, data domain, uh, the, uh, the data set from the same uh, data domain. The third one is uh, cross-domain pre-training is the combination of one, of one and two. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, so the further training, could you go back to the previous slide? Yes. So, the concept of further training is that you further pre-training is that you pre-train your model, like such as BERT or GPT on a large unlabeled text corpora. And then you take that and then you pre-train them again in, in like the target domain. Is that the basic concept? Um, uh, just, uh, wait, wait, just wait a moment. Uh, mm -hmm.
저희 팀원분들 혹시 다른 분들 설명해 주실 수 있을까요? 아, uh, yeah. Uh, Han Moon Sun, yeah, uh, yeah, so Han Moon uh, Sun all said right. So I, I guess I'm uh, confused with uh, the difference between in domain and cross domain pre training. So within task, I can, so I guess I'm gonna, I'm asking to Mr. Moon Sun, but what I'm saying, what I'm asking is so within task is you take the pre trained language model, I mean, not language, pre trained whatever model, BERT or GPT, you take that and then apply that again to the data set that you are interested in where the where the target remain target resides you pre-train them again in that specific specific data set that would be within task but could you explain what's the difference between in domain and cross domain pre-training you, you can take the mic if you if you want Cross domain 같은 경우에는 같은 domain이지만 이제 네. 다른 dataset을 사용 같이 사용하는 것을 의미하고요. 네. In domain은 task에서 정의했던 dataset을 활용하는 것을 의미합니다. 음. 야, cross domain 한 번만 다시 설명해 주실래요? 그, 어, 예를 들어서 mimic 3 같은 경우에는 네네. 리서치 서머리를 저희가 테스크 데이터로 활용했다고 하면은 예. 그 널싱 노트 같은 이제 다른 비슷한 동물이지만 다른 데이터셋을 활용하는 것을 의미. 아, 그 인도메인은 그럼 아예 같은 데이, 비슷한 예. 데이터셋인 거고 위딘 테스크는 아예 같은 데이터셋이면서도 동시에 이제 실제로 우리가 타겟 테스크를 그러니까 타겟 테스크를 사용할 데이터셋을 쓰는 거고요. 네. 네, 알겠습니다. 네, 진행하시죠. Okay. Um. Mm -hmm. So next one. Yes. So, so BioBird is a further pre-trained bird uh, using a biomedical corpor. So um, BioBird uh, uh, opens BERT in a variety of biomedical text mining. Uh, since the world of distribution, medical corpora is uh, different from uh, that of uh, general domain corpora. Um, so uh, for the output layer of, uh, in BERT model, we uh, come up with uh, different types of representation extraction as follows. The first is using a mean pooling. Uh, so here uh, we use, um, uh, yeah, so we use um, uh, attention, uh, soft attention, or uh, so like this, but also we uh, uh, like next one. Uh, so yeah, so next one is uh, use soft attention in camel model. Uh, also, we try uh, we use tried uh, general soft attention mechanism as well. Um, we experimented uh, the model on Mimic 350 and Mimic 34, uh, which has a number of labels uh, to 50 and 8,922 respectively. Uh, so in these data sets, we, are, uh, they, uh, we have two challenges for large scale classification and long document handling problem. So uh, uh, results uh, with bi and bio, BERT and BioBERT. Uh, sorry, so, uh, could, you, could you go to the previous slide? I just missed the data set description. Number of labels to so mimic three fifty is a subset of mimic three full. Is that is that true? Oh, you've just taken, uh, or did you just take the most top top fifty frequent labels? Yeah, I guess I don't really see the difference. Uh, how did you come up with Mimic 350?
All right, I guess like any, anyone can answer the question from the team. 1단수의 기준으로 50, 상위 50개 맞습니다. 아, 네, 알겠습니다. 아, 근데 왜 트레이닝 도큐먼트의 개수가 다르죠? 그러니까 도큐먼트 개수 똑같으면서 레이블만 상위 50개를 추린 거 아닌가요? 어... 저기 증상이 네. 총 8,000개인가 그렇게 되는데 네, 네. 이제 상위 50개만 뽑게 되면 50개의 증상이 있는 그 데이터들만 추렸을 아... 때 8,000개가 나오는 네. 것 같아요 네 알겠습니다, 알겠습니다. 네. 네. 네 감사합니다 네, 진행하시죠. 네. Okay. Um. So. Again, our uh, uh, results are uh, from uh, BERT and BioBERT uh, showed uh, unfortunately worse performance than the baseline uh, camel. Um. So uh, we tried um variant version of BERT model uh, because um the size of BERT model is too large. It's like 110 million parameters. So we decided to use our um, brand, uh, variant, uh, variant version of BERT model that's smaller than the original one. Uh, the BERT tiny is here is a chosen or the sort of uh, for a model uh, running on large scale documents. So we used, uh, we chose uh, BERT tiny instead of BERT base. Um, and here, uh, bird tiny uh, uh, still uh, doesn't uh, work uh, better than the baseline. Then, so uh, although um, bird showed the best performance in various annual tests, but but the model has been pre-trained with uh, maximum five hundred twelve tokens, and moreover, uh, almost uh, medical technology, uh, almost uh, most of our tech medical tech, uh, terminologies couldn't be expressed by pre-trained weights for from a broad model. So to come up uh, get over this uh, limitation, uh, we uh, used uh, two different embedding methods as follows. The first one is weights pre-trained by uh, war to back method. Uh, and the second one is always uh, uh, redefined by a uh, byte pair encoding. So uh, here, um, both tiny and uh, what to back uh, shows the best performance. Um, I'm sorry, could, could you go back to the previous slide? That's a pretty significant improvement in the F1 score. Okay, cool. Please continue. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so we also uh, uh, implemented further uh, pre-training on Mimic 3 discharge summary documents. Uh, we expect the model outputs good performance by learning the medical knowledge. So for the pre-trained method is um, <laughs> worse than or without it. <laughs> Uh, so we also tried many other experiments for to increase performance. So for tiny parallel, again, again the best result. So use multiple bird tiny model in parallel uh, shows that like this. Uh, okay, so the results are for our Mimic three fifty like this and Mimic 3.4. So we did the same experiment on Mimic 3.4. Uh, it's like based on the result of Mimic 3.50. So um, that, uh, now could you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, sure. So Mimic 350, Bird Tiny Parallel was able to outperform the previous best, the Camel and DR Camel, but not on Mimic 3 full. That's interesting. Interesting. Okay, let's let's continue. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then 
uh, we also found that the uh, camel uh, uh, predicts some code as all false, or but um, bird uh, based model uh, sort of uh, comes up with the, the F1 score like this. So here, like a uh, camel F1 score in worst case, um, like code 285 that line is sort of uh, then. But uh, in, on the other hand, uh, bird F1 score is uh, somehow is. Uh, uh, output uh, and so overall that uh, this chart shows that uh, uh, bird is a uh, uh, orange color and the uh, camel is blue so bird uh, shows uh, regular uh, a uniform performance but uh, meanwhile camel shows some better performance in some cases So finally, <laughs> conclusion and future works. Uh, we uh, applied a bot model uh, to predict medical code from uh, MIMI-3 discharge summaries. Uh, as a result, our bird tiny model with pre-trained word to vec and increased the uh, maximum sentence length outperforms uh, the baseline model camel or on all our metrics. And applying label description regularization uh, in domain for uh, further uh, pre tree method, uh, which uses the other uh, clinical holes in mimic 3 a uh, hierarchical attention mechanism uh, can be our future works. So, questions and feedbacks are welcome. Uh, thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, could you go back to the previous slide, thing, please? So, number two, as a result, bird tiny increased. Bird tiny with increased maximum sense of outperformance baseline models on all metrics. That that only applies to mimic three fifty, right? Because mimic three full camel was still outperforming all bird variants. Is that correct? Discharge summary, the pre-trainer has had that one in the day. Get got but tiny eater than the pre-training hunger. You could not sing, sing, but tiny eater. Discharge summary, a man pre-training or hunger. Yeah, good. Google is a Jagung and but tiny pre-train model. Hajadaba, discharge summary. Google. The accident and then the Munsunimi to the position. Oh, do I send the word embedding weights? Manta check. Ah, 네, 알겠습니다. 그러면은 근데 그 디스차지 서머리의 가를 이용해서 지금 클리니컬 코딩을 할 건데 그러면은 적어도 전체 디스차지 서머리에다가 프리 트레이닝 하신 건 아니죠? 왜냐면 그거는 치팅이니까. 그러니까 적어도 트레이닝 셋의 디스차지 서머리에 대해서만 프리 트레이닝, 퍼더 프리 트레이닝을 한 거죠. 네, 알겠습니다. 네, 네, 알겠습니다. 네, 우리 트레이닝 셋 제가 말씀. 풀에서 왜안 되는지 좀 궁금하긴 하네요. 네. 그렇죠. 네. 어떻게 저의 복잡성에서 시도는 하는데, 네. 
네, 조금 좀 독특하긴 한데 제 생각에는 버트를 프리트레이닝 하신 다음 그 위에다가 지금 이제 CNS 토큰 가지고 그 멀티 레이블 프리딕션 하신 거죠? 이제 슬라이드에서 여기 방식이었는데 세 가지 방식, 저그 슬라 어떤 방식을 말씀하시는 거죠? 제가 세 번. 아, 아까 그 버트에서 나온 거를 사용된 아, 네, 그 소프트 어텐션으로 아, 그래서 버트에서 나온 컨텍스트 인베딩들을 전부 다 소프트 어텐션 이용해 가지고 섞어서 이제 최종 예측을 했다는 거죠. 네, 알겠습니다. 제 생각에는 그거 위에다가 그러니까 최종적으로 나온 컨텍스트 인베딩에다가 정확하게 캐머를 얹었으면은 만약 원디 컨볼루션을 얹었으면은 더잘 되지 않았을까 생각이 문득 드네요. 네. 네. 아, 예, 예, 예. 안타깝네요. 그, 다른, 그, 스티, 뭐지, 캐멀 말고도 이제 한두개 정도 더 프리비어스 워크들을 소개를 해주셨는데, 걔네들의 오토매틱 코드, 그러니까 클리니컬 코딩 성능이 캐멀보다 좋진 않았나요? 걔네들이 테이블에 그 베이스라인으로 안 들어가 있길래. 아, 네, 알겠습니다. 그럼 뭐. 아, 그렇군요. 하긴 더 좋았으니까 논문을 썼겠죠. 네. 버트, 의외로 버트를 대충 그냥 그, 바이오메디컬 도메인으로 갔다가 하면은 성능이 그렇게 썩 좋지는 않다는 거네요. 좀 신기하네요. 혹시 바이오 버트를, 아, 어, 더막 얻는 거. 네네네네네. 혹시 바이오 버트는 써보셨나요? 네. 네네. <웃음> 네. 또 신기하네요. 혹시 오토매틱 이 클리니컬 코딩 쪽의 논문 공, 그, 릴레이티드 워크 서베이 하시면서 버트를 사용한 논문은 하나도 없었나요, 그러면은? 아, 음. 나중에 이 슬라이드 제출하실 때, 그, 개, 개 것까지, 그, 이제, 버트 쓰는, 데이터셋은 다르지만 버트를 쓰는 그 릴레이티드 워크도 포함해서 슬라이드를 제출해 주시면 좋겠습니다. 네. 혹시 다른 분들 뭐 구, 피드백이나 궁금하신 점 있으세요? 저만 너무 물어보고 있네요 지금 시간이 한 네, 그래도 한 5분 정도는 쓸수 있을 것 같은데요 Any question from the audience? 에스 나 please don't, do not forget to evaluate on your Evaluate sheet, and uh, I forgot to tell you, but I forgot to announce that this you can you can revise your submissions once you've after you've submitted. So don't worry about you know making mistakes or anything. You can always revise your submission. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then thank you very much to team one, and let's move to team two then. Uh, evaluation, ah, 잠시만요. Evaluation, 매 발표 끝나고. 
아, 근데, 아니, 그 발표 끝나고 이제, 아니, 그, 기억을 하시, 하, 하시, 하셨다가, 기억하셨다가, 어디 딴데 써놓고 여기다 다 이제 이 포, 구글 폼에다 하셔도 되긴 하지만, 그 구글 폼에 그냥 쓰신 다음에, 일단, 일단 이제 오늘은 팀 1, 2만 있으니까, 팀 3, 팀 4는 그냥 뭐다 5점을 주고 서브미션 하셨, 하셨다가, 다음번에 다시 와서 리바이스 해도 되거든요. 왜냐면 제가 말씀드렸듯이 이거 리바이스가 가능하니까, 그 링크가 다, 이거를, 서브밋 하시면은 자기 이메일 레드레스에 그 링크가 갈 거예요. 그럼 이제 그거를 다시 나중에 열어서 또 바꿀 수 있게 해놨거든요, 제가. 그러니까 그냥 이번 주그 목요일까지만 저한테 제출해 주시면 돼요. 뭐 언제 세이브를 따로 하셨든가 하시든 뭐 미리 서브미션 하시든 그건 이제 뭐 적당히 편하신 대로 하시면 됩니다. 오케이. Okay. All right. Uh, can you see the, the slides? Yeah, but I see some weird, weird uh, square uh -huh. with the okay. with the like Hold green on. boundary. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, okay, that's good. I think. Uh, uh, oh, it's setting a, a like a region. Oh, okay. That's this. Yeah, this looks fine. That's the right. mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, now I'll tell you a little bit about what we've been. Uh, why does it not grow with the slides? Okay. And don't worry too much about it. Yeah, that won't. What we've been uh, trying to do. Yeah, sure. I've been trying to do in the past uh, few weeks. So the theme of our project uh, was handling sequential data. And in particular, we focused on ECG or uh, electrocardiograms. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to generate data. So either uh, generate in a, um, a variational setting where we sample new uh, realistic ECG pulses or we recover them from other sensor uh, information. So first I'll give you maybe a few minutes uh, so that you can appreciate better the results later because being a data generation task, a lot of it is uh, visual as well. Um, the ECG uh, data is a voltage signal and it's deeply connected with uh, the heart, uh, heart pulses. So one of those spikes that you see is exactly one uh, heart pulse. Uh, it's hopefully a periodic signal. If it's not, it means there's a big problem. The heart is not working correctly. Though there can be irregularities and this is important. So the period uh, while injecting some kind of knowledge about this periodic behavior is useful, it needs to be flexible to changes in, uh, in the period. And these changes can, be, can come from a variety of factors. And these are why ECG is a useful diagnostic for medical experts. Because uh, to, an, to an expert eye from an ECG pulse, you can tell a lot about the patient. You can tell uh, about information. You can extract information about their current state, so whether uh, they're under uh, uh, an they're doing like, some kind of exercise if they're having an irregular sleep schedule if they have uh, disturbances or imbalances in the electrolytes because electrolytes are what actually regulates this uh, this pulse this polarization depolarization of the heart uh, so this is this is like motivating the importance of, of this data set and why um, it, it might be used in the future and it is used in a lot of uh, machine learning applications to detect these, for example, detecting electrolyte disturbances from ECG signal and why we need more, uh, a wider availability of this type of data through synthetic generation. So this is the shape of an ECG uh, signal. Um, it's got a few phases. Um, these phases, a lot of the current baseline methods use these phases explicitly, so they manipulate the loss uh, to give it this explicit, ex explicit uh, shape. Um, so it's, it's good to know uh, that there's, there's like three major phases, P, QRS, the QRS is the peak, and these are depolarization of uh, atria, uh, some, some chambers in the heart. And ventricles and then this is the repolarization phase after after this and you get a bunch of these in, in a sequence uh, usually these are collect, collected uh, through what is called 12 lead ECG where they just put a bunch of electrolytes on your body 
so that they have um, a point of reference for the voltage. So it's an external, the point is it's an external, uh, it's collected externally. So there is also a lot of noise. It's an irregular signal, it's continuous, but it's also noisy. Um, so to further motivate this, um, what we said before about all these um, say issues that you can detect, all this information about the patient, these are the, the classic latent factors that uh, are very popular, in my, have always been popular in machine learning. And so the vision, I say this is like a, pre a preliminary work, but the vision behind this, uh, this, this task and a lot of the papers that are coming out 2019 and, and this year, this one, uh, you, you've seen a lot of um, interest in ECG generation. Before it's always been classification or segmentation. Uh, but 2019, for some reason, uh, especially using GANS, this has uh, taken um, say the, the deep learning community by storm. And uh, say the vision that hasn't been achieved yet is having something like those uh, face generation models that uh, you might have seen, where you have a bunch of sliders, like uh, um, uh, shape of the head, like roundness of the head, uh, nose size, glasses, uh, smiling or not. And you, you tune these latent factors and you generate a, a, a face that respects those. So the vision for ECG would be having, uh, and for sequential data in general, because this hasn't been done. Sequential data is a lot more uh, complications than, than just a, a static image. We'll be having something like uh, electrolyte balance, uh, stress levels, and a bunch of latent factors about the patient. And you generate an ECG signal of maybe a second or a few pulses that follows this, these latent factors that a medical expert can use to augment uh, some ECG ML data set that they're using for a task. So they're, they're noticing from their expert eye that they're missing some uh, combinations of, of patients and latent factors and they cannot augment the data. So this is the, say, the vision. And this, this work doesn't achieve that vision, by the way. So <laughs> it will take a lot more work. Um, so yeah, th this is uh, what a machine that uh, collects ECG looks like. It's a uh, bunch of those electrolytes. And um, there's, there's even uh, consumer level machines that you can buy. Um, so it's not very intrusive. It's, it's uh, not commonly available because it takes a lot of um, expertise to filter and to, uh, with a 12 lab that I mentioned before. But in, in, in principle, it's, it's not that difficult to, to achieve. Okay, so in terms of challenges, aside from uh, difficulties involving sequential data and everything and domain expertise, which we're all facing in these, uh, in these uh, projects. Uh, in this case, uh, the approaches involve a lot of mathematical assumptions and involve a lot of um, fairly nasty math. Um, if you skim uh, papers that try to model ECG signals analytically, uh, these involve coupled of the EPD systems, so, uh, ordinary differential equations and partial differential equation systems, because you have the continuous signal, the ODE part, but you also have waved, waves that propagate, uh, you know, you have vibrations and stuff. So these are really high dimensional and nasty, honestly, to, to do. And the more detail they, they get, the more assumptions that the experts put in, the more likely they are to be wrong. Uh, so a lot of the simulators, you find some simulators um, from the early 2000s uh, where you can generate, um, they just follow these, uh, these um, the closed form uh, formulas and they generate ECG signals, but they're limited to what was put in uh, at the beginning. And from my research, these are not really used in any capacity. It's like they're mostly an academic curiosity. So. Uh, this is interesting and everything, I guess the, the most relevant part is that um, is the continuous nature that's, still, that's also used in the analytic analysis part of this domain that uh, will inform our methodology, the uh, DOD nature of these signals. So data sets, we experimented with a few of them, but um, I chose this one uh, in the end because it's enough for our purposes. It's a fairly new data set on Physionet. That's called simultaneous physiological measurements with five devices and five devices at different cognitive and physical loads. It doesn't involve a lot of patients, just 13. Uh, but what it does involve is a fairly big amount of data for these patients, around 20 minutes of, uh, of sensor data. And not just ECG, 
got a bunch of other stuff, respiration, tidal, volume, oxygen, blah, blah, blah. And also for each of these, uh, not all of them, but most of them have been collected with uh, multiple devices. So you, you get, um, with more expertise, um, to be honest, we haven't really uh, used this like multi-device to uh, like regularize the data or check for uh, big inconsistencies, but that, that does require more information about how it was collected. But I think they did that already in pre-processing. Um, they use this multi-device to give it more, um, to clean it up a bit more. Um, in terms of the 20 minutes, it's because it's divided into phases. So the experiment involves the patient uh, doing a bunch of stuff, first resting, then walking, then doing an auditive task where they're asked to listen to a passage and then recall a few uh, like details about the passage. And then a slightly more strenuous uh, physical exercise, walking at the same speed, but on an incline, an incline. So these are, we don't use them explicitly. We wanted the, the data set that has these for say, future work for the conditioning phase, so for the variational model, we like to have uh, you know, a model that can uh, be conditioned on resting ECG uh, signals and speed out resting ECG signals or walking. So it's like a, uh, it's a simpler version of what I, I said before of those uh, latent factors. Uh, just say a very specific type of latent factors that involve their uh, physical and a little bit of mental state, I guess, with the auditive task. Um, could could you back, go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So, uh, what what does that what does it mean by no explicit use of different phases? Because there are four different types of ECG collected by doing different behaviors. So, yeah. what would that what would actually be using different phases be like? Um, say encoding. Uh, the, the way we use them is um, by using the entire data set. So that the ECGs are not that different. And the level, say the, um, the details that change uh -huh. are the kind of details that uh, are really difficult to capture, that to capture, and I'm not sure we captured the really fine high frequency details. Um, I mean, the difference between the detail difference between like resting and walking resting and, and walking, yeah, exactly. So we oh, okay. use the entire data set as, as one corpus, but ideally, we wanted to have this uh, degree of freedom for later when we, we do capture these um, finer details. I see, I see, okay, cool. Um, yeah. So, okay, um, this is uh, the data set. So at the bottom you see ECG, uh, say that uh, the real life version uh, is a lot uglier than, than previous slide. Um, and at the top you see uh, the other sensor data, so acceleration in no specific order, breathing rate, heart rate, uh, Tidal volume, etc. But in, um, like in, uh, yeah. well, what are the what, what do each columns represent? Uh, these are the the four uh, say phases. Oh, like resting, walking, all that. Resting, walking. Yeah, you see that. I mean, I see. Uh, there's maybe some difference in the the QRS uh, peak amplitude. But, uh, it's see if I can uh, maybe zoom in. Difficult for me to see as well. It's really small. That's weird. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess there aren't too many differences between different like behaviors. So that's yeah. Even the vibe, it's it's not clear, and uh, yeah, it, it's not clear even in the in the data set. They don't really explain. So they just provide this difference. It, it's not clear that the uh, the this type of exit of strenuous activity is enough. To cause uh, I, this is walking. It's not that that fast. So yeah, uh, the, yeah. They're all healthy adults. I don't think is uh, uh yeah. <laughs> we're not yeah. Okay. Them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so baseline. Uh, oh, baselines. Uh, we talked about baselines uh, last time, a little bit. Mm. Um, uh, the general like sequential GAN uh, baselines, like RC GAN, it just uses uh, LSTMs. Uh, the time gun one that in introduces a bunch of new components that we'll see again later really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. There's some specific baselines uh, for GAN generation um, that uh, go from this year. So this year is when the, this has become more interesting for some reason to the community. 
and these use uh, uh, they tune the loss function uh, basically pgam uh, changes the loss function to retain some of the the p q r s t characteristics of the of the the wave so it's a uh, it's tinkering with the loss function to get better better signals um and so the pgan so, so the pgans and the second ecg that they they also use lstm combined with the gan loss function yeah, they're they're very similar to like a simple sequential GAN formulation. Uh, they're not just use LSTM or uh, just an RNN, uh, mm -hmm. but I it's see, a simple see. extension, uh, mostly to uh, tinkering with, um, with loss and training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's this new one that we have, uh, haven't had time to try, uh, but it's promising. It's a general purpose. It came out this year for uh, it's under review for new It's a CW mm -hmm. GAN. Uh, which claims to be time gun. So time gun apparently for some, uh, so they say for some types of data is the best, the uh, gun mm -hmm. for sequential data, for like stocks and uh, for continuous signals, it's, it's not clear and uh, we uh, we show that it doesn't really work that well. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of tuning and <laughs> so. But the uh, time gun uh, idea, just really quickly, we saw in class how a gun uh, works just as these two competing neural networks. Uh, time gun introduces two more. So they're claimed that it, uh, it's as simple to train as a, as a regular gun doesn't hold that much ground. Mm. They, they double the amount of components and they introduce two more loss terms uh, with a bunch of hyperparameters. Uh, the, the reason for these two, so you have discriminator generator that we studied in class, but you also have embedding and uh, recovery neural networks because you want to have, you want to form a, a this latent space such that uh, two things need to happen. One, you need to be able to recover, so to decode your encoded data. So this is just a simple MSC or uh, two norm loss on the stuff that you encode, you decode. And the other thing that needs to happen is uh, this needs to be useful to have the one step conditionals because uh, it's a sequential data. So here you're modeling in the latent space, you're modeling the probability of a certain observation, uh, mm -hmm. encoded observation, conditioned on the history. Okay, and they have a special network that does this one-step uh, prediction, basically. So there's one-step prediction loss, there's reconstruction loss, and then there's the GAN loss. And all mm -hmm. these, complete, they're combined together, they're balanced together. Uh, these three that we saw last time, that's just uh, uh, encoded and decoded. This is the one that we saw in class, uh, same, just written in a different way. Um, where you have the uh, discriminator that's trying to uh, maximize the log likelihood and the other one that's trying to minimize, trying to fool the discriminator. And then you have this one, which is the one-step prediction. So the true encoded HD, the latent uh, representation of XT, the observation, um, needs to be the same as this. This is the one-step prediction network, uh, taking the history or the one step. Uh, in practice, it just takes the one step before HD. Um, what would HS be? H, okay. So they, they split, uh, we don't use this, um, but they split features uh, in uh, temporal and uh, static. Oh, okay, uh, I see. All right. So mm -hmm. just, yeah, just a vector, maybe a conditioning vector, for example. Mm -hmm. that type of. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this would be useful for later and also for the task definition. That's why I'm going to uh, talk about it now, two minutes. Uh, just a super basic intro to what variational inference is because we you do use for one a small experiment we do use a variational model so variational models are deeply connected with uh, probabilistic models and the way let's say that the, the what their objective uh, the objective of these probabilistic models is to find some hidden z uh, and they want to model this joint uh, probability distribution of X, X are the observables, for example, in our case, the sensor uh, time series, and these latent factor Z. Why is this interesting? This just random like joint probability of, of Z, which we don't even know what they are, because then we can recover the posterior, which is just, this just the definition of, of conditional probability, posterior. So we want to condition on ob observations, condition on some ECG signals, for example, and then we want to sample from the posterior. So we want to get uh, likely uh, samples of ECG pulses from a certain type of ECG pulse that we, we want. 
problem is this is intractable in uh, most cases because of the denominator. And so this is just a general problem statement. Variational inference is a solution approach to this problem. It's not the whole thing, it's just the solution, one of the many solutions. And it's variational just means it becomes an optimization problem and the optimization problem is this, uh, where you choose a, a, a distribution family, like Gaussian, so just exponential family, wider distribution. And then you search in this bag of, of parameterized often distributions. You search, you optimize, gradient descent for a distribution, a, a variational posterior, an approximate posterior, that's as close as possible to this, which is what we want, because if we have this, we can sample, condition and sample. So this is the problem. And this is, if you choose a specific type of, uh, of uh, this loss function, this D, this divergence, like KL divergence, reverse KL divergence, you get the elbow that you see, you know, ML papers. So this would be used later. So the tasks that we uh, consider are two. Uh, say first ECG uh, recovery, where we input is everything else except ECG. And uh, uh, this is a more traditional uh, machine learning task. Mm -hmm. and we want to output uh, the likely ECG signal by just maximizing log likelihood or minimizing some MSC loss. This is traditional with training and test set. We just want to, and we use this for um, mostly um, like expressivity testing to see if the model can actually uh, learn that type of signal. It's not clear mm -hmm. always. And then the second one is latent generation. So um, this is why it, it was useful to have the slide before. Q, the, this is the approximate posterior. We want to recover this, we want to learn this so that then we can condition on, on some ECG and we want to obtain new ECGs that have the same characteristics or that, that look similar, but they're new. So to do data augmentation without just adding noise or doing a, a simpler stuff. These are the two very simple tasks. In terms of sequence length, we test various ranges from 30 points um, to 500, so roughly one second, uh, more than one second. I think Hertz was two, 256 Hertz, so it's closer to two seconds actually. Mm -hmm. Are you interested in interpretable Z or just, just continuous representation of Z? Uh, for now, just uh, continuous representation, but the yeah, interpretable would be uh, be a later step. Cool. Uh, this entangled interpretable. Okay, so time gun, uh, not very nice. Um, these are the posterior samples of time gun. Um, we tested on so time gun. Um, the in the paper they don't provide actually um, visual samples. They just provide um, U map visualization, like you map mm -hmm. is like a Disney or a, like a nonlinear PCA, a way to visualize into the, even, even for their sinusoids. So they don't provide samples, uh, which is strange for a GAN, a GAN paper. Um, and even in the sinusoids data set that we tried, uh, they don't perform that well. Um, so the fact that they don't have any continuous, um, say bias, doesn't help, they're not periodic. Uh, which makes it the optimization even worse. They have all these hyperparameters. Um, so all in all, we tried uh, this take, uh, maybe take five to 10 hours to train. They're not that big uh, time mm. Are they uh, also using I, RNN as a sequence component? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, they use, the, similar to say an NRC GAN in mm -hmm. the DG uh, components. But then they have those two. It's like an, an RC GAN plus, let's say, mm -hmm. those additional loss. Uh, probably, probably, might probably, probably be possible to get better samples, but uh, this is um, with a lot of tuning, this is what we got mm -hmm. as, as a baseline. So, our method uh, shouldn't be too difficult to do better than that. Uh, I'll give you a few slides on um, uh, a few components of uh, our methodology because you will get uh, quite, become kind of a Frankenstein monster of, of the model, of all the things. So at least you have an idea of, of uh, if, it, if this is the first time you, you saw a neural ODs, you might be confused, but I hope you can at least follow. Uh, so neural ODs, um, just the only thing you need to keep in mind, uh, you'll know what the neural network is. An input gets transformed in some way into an output. Neural ODs are not different. 
uh, it only changes what you do uh, inside between input X and output Y. And what you do in NeuralOD is you take your input, uh, your input becomes, this is a, just a linear transformation, you can ignore this for this presentation, becomes the initial condition of an OD, uh, calculus one, the differential equations, and then you solve the OD with uh, whatever method you want. In calculus one, we saw to solve these uh, analytically by hand. If it's linear, you can do that. If it's not linear, you have to use an approximate method. And then you get an output of the OD. So the final point of the OD, which is the output of your neural OD. That's all it, it is. It just, uh, the, the transformation is an OD. So what, why this is nice sometimes, not always, it's because it's, you, you're sure that the thing in between is continuous. It has to be continuous if, if it's solved correctly. So that's nice for, for the ECG stuff. Uh, the second thing that uh, is useful is you can, the optimization for that thing before, you can write in this form, it looks fancy, optimal control, but it's nothing more than, uh, this is the mini batching sum and average, so ignore this. This is a loss, okay? You want to minimize loss, find the, the parameters data that minimize loss. And now you put the OD, the dynamics, the continuous stuff, you put in the constraint. Okay, this is just a way to, formula, um, to formalize the problem before. This is the neural OD, it's now in the constraints. Why this is nice? Because from here, then you, you derive the adjoint, a bunch of special methods to train um, the neural OD. And from that, you can uh, handle something that you can't handle um, with the regular neural networks. So it's a couple of steps to get to here. This is the interesting steps. Step. In regular neural networks, uh, usually you have a loss, think about squared error or cross entropy that takes your output, the final thing that you spit out and maybe the ground truth. Um, but here you can have a loss that's distributed on inside this, this uh, Think of the neural OD as a layer, so you can distribute the loss inside and optimize the parameters inside. So this is an integral because it's dis distributed in S. This is the integration of the OD, integration integral. So point of this is if you can distribute, um, if the OD is modeling the ECG, with this you can have a point by point, it's like an infinitesimal point by point squared error loss, for example, that makes it uh, easier to match the signal instead of just having like a, a, a collection of points that you're minimizing, like if you, if you were to use an RNN, you have the whole thing covered. Is there an uh, analytical solution to the integral part? To this? Uh, no, yeah. for most, um, yeah, for most cases. Um, you could find one if uh, this was a linear OD and this was a special, like a quadratic loss, uh, then you, mm -hmm. can, you can find the, uh, in, in uh, like a linear um, dynamical systems uh, control, you can uh, find a close form for this, for the optimal control problem, for square data and just linear ODs, basically. That's yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. um, okay, almost, almost finished. The other thing that we used is this special type of, um, of neural ODs, where the weights are a function. They're not a, a fixed uh, uh, vector of tensor. Because in, in here, in the, in the vanilla version, you don't have this, you just have theta. Uh, here it takes this variable S, which is the integration domain. And it, it's a function of S, but you can still think of them as, as just uh, a tensor that, that's changing in, in S, basically. And uh, they change in a specific way that's easy to optimize with gradient descent. So they're still using gradient descent. Um, there is some, there an eigenfunction expansion. If you're not familiar with what that means, this is just a, a summation of some scalar parameters, gamma k, optimized via gradient descent, and some other functions that are easy to compute, fast to compute, because this needs to be solved many times uh, during optimization. One uh, interesting uh, case for ECG for these uh, functions here is the Fourier basis because the Fourier functions, uh, if you've taken a signal processing, or just I think we studied these in calculus as well, they're periodic func functions, they're just sinusoids, sines and cosines. And they're really good at representing periodic uh, signals, compositions of sines and cosines. And ECG looks like it's a fairly complicated high frequency composition of sines and cosines. 
uh, what, what uh, we do in, uh, in addition to, this is already available in the literature, in the papers, we add dilation and shift, which we needed here, uh, because uh, what we said before, the TCG, it's periodic, but it's irregular. Uh, so the, the period will change. So we want a, an optimizable parameter that can allow the period to change and also to shift. We want to shift sometimes the sinusoids. Mm -hmm. So we just give a bunch of sinusoids that can shift and, and change the period. And we hope that's enough for, for easy. Um, so in this case, the theta alphas, the theta betas, and the omega and lambdas are the learnable parameters? Yeah, they're just the gamma case split into all oh, this uh, k missing here. Uh, here oh, you have, mm -hmm. for m, m uh, functions, you have m parameters here, you have two m. For each m, you have uh, both a sine and a cosine. Although you could just scrap this and just have uh, signs. Sh should should the omegas and lambdas also have the k subscripts? Okay, that's an, an interesting question. Maybe maybe yes. Uh, we had a, a um, um, yeah, no, they do. Definitely, they do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they do. Yes, it's just missing in the slides. Yeah, because right. otherwise, right. kill everything. Mm -hmm. uh, the sh yeah, shift and dilation both. Have. Okay. Mm, okay, and last, uh, just from variation, all the stuff that we talked about ten minutes before, um, the elbow loss uh, for neural ODs. There is a variational neural OD formulation that was already existing. Uh, you can think of this as an autoencoder, where the encoder and the coder are for sequential data. And um, this you get from choosing KL divergence, reverse KL divergence from the optimization problem that I talked about before. I won't talk about uh, about the details uh, here. This is just a balance of two terms. Um, we're trying to balance the closeness of the operational posterior to the prior and then maximizing the likelihood. Uh, this you can just stare for five minutes and read the tutorial operational inference and the other slides, and you'll uh, understand. It's very simple. Uh, the simplest form of variational inference. Okay, so there's three attempts that we had. Uh, first attempt is like an expressivity check, uh, very simple. Uh, one linear layer, encoder and decoder, so it's barely a latent space, basically not a latent space, it's just a linear transformation of the observation space. Uh, we use an integral loss, that's a squared error loss of this uh, latents and the observations. And the stuff that evolves uh, the signal in this uh, almost latent space is a neural OD, okay? So we have one linear layer encoder, neural OD, one linear layer decoder. Uh, that's using the Fourier dilation shift, whatever that we talked about before. And this is for recovery. So we feed the other signals to this and we recover the data using this. we in the standard training test loss, uh, test, test set and everything. And uh, oh. it's okay. It, yeah. it, um, it's uh, uh, the, the fine details are lost like these um, which are not part of the these are like noise I guess this would be nice as a denoising <laughs> model because these so are when you say that you're re you're recovering from different signals there were like a bunch of different like heart rates and like blood pressure and all that so you're using yeah. that information to reconstruct ECG yes I see uh, using uh, acceleration uh, respiration rate and uh, breathing rate and a bunch of others yeah uh, mm -hmm. we saw before like the the peaks the peaks were fairly easy to, re to recover from the other signals uh, i'm not mm -hmm. sure which other sensor data has the a similar peak but the rest the shape is also recovered and this is mm -hmm. not part of the ecg uh, these these little oscillations are not uh, it's like a t qrs p i think or p mm -hmm. qrs mm -hmm. so um, yeah uh, works okay the second attempt, um, similar task, we just um, complicate the latent space because remember that our goal would be to have eventually that the slider thing with like the cup, like interpretable latent representation mm -hmm. structurally. So we try to make the latent a bit more complicated to see uh, if we can recover some of the more finer details. So we use a BioLSTM encoder. Uh, by the STMs for no particular reason. It uh, shouldn't really even matter too much because these are periodic, but I, we just did it. 
and a three-layer uh, nonlinear decoder. So the, the latent, latent space is uh, significantly different. Mm -hmm. And the task is, is the same. So Galier, King, Nero, or the Fourier dilation shift uh, from other, other sensor data. And now the mean average percentage error is pretty small. Although I think it was small before too. Um, it wasn't this small. Uh, but you still see like, these oscillations are still not recovered. You, you do get some of the smaller details. Um, all the other samples look, look like this. So there's mm -hmm. basically always this uh, oscillation part, which is always ignored. Um, I think with some more training, it might be possible to recover these or by giving more uh, Fourier um, sinusoids, the M. Oh, the number of M's, yeah. Um, yeah, if you go higher, you can recover higher higher frequency. It's almost how also many M's are you using now? Here we're using uh, actually it's pretty high. Um, I think for both here for here definitely one hundred, which is very well, high. Okay. Never, I've never used one hundred uh, <laughs> of, of that model, uh, so it's it also takes a bit. To, so this just to give you an idea, to train takes um, more than ten hours, and uh, oh okay, maybe scheduling uh, would help. Like, uh, it, we did no scheduling, just simple uh, Adam move on mm -hmm. uh, 10 minus 3. With scheduling, it might be possible, like with the smaller learning rates, to, to recover this. Yeah. Like, yeah. Also increasing, but that would take maybe a few days uh, of training, maybe. And the final attempt, um, I think this is the coolest, but it's um, it's also preliminary, like the other ones, uh, using the variational framework. Um, which is eventually what we want. I mean, encoder decoder without variational. Uh, this can be nice, but it, it it's not simple to sample from. Like mm -hmm. Argo was eventually sampling from this. It's just a nice, a nice proof, proof of concept. But from this one, we can sample. This is uh, the model is similar. So we have an encoder and a decoder, but now it's a variational. So the optimization, the loss changes. We used the elbow before. Mm -hmm. It's a neural OD. Um, it's Hamiltonian, um, which I haven't talked about. That would take too long. But uh, it's not very different from the Galierkin formulation. Uh, Hamiltonian just means that there is something that's preserved. There's a quantity. It's a, an OD that preserves, that, that preserves some quantity. And in physical systems, that's the energy. And it's also good for periodic signals. That's why we use this. It's just another way of doing it. Um, so you're uh, no longer using Galearkin neural OD? Uh, no, because uh, with uh, um, we tried, but um, this plus Galearkin uh, breaks. OK, so no more, no more sine or just, cosine functions. It's yeah, something yeah, else. Just because this is uh, it, just in practice, it's it's a bit faster to than having like a one hundred sinusoids. Because we need to that's uh, okay. very difficult so to solve. Yeah, the, is it more like polynomial or something else? The uh, eigenfunctions. Yeah. Um, it's uh, it's a completely different. Um, so the thetas are fixed. They're not anymore a function of anything. They're fixed. Oh, okay, I see. Uh -huh. It's it just changes the the OD is different. Okay. It's a second order system, and it's, yeah, it's what f physical systems. It's for uh, periodic conservative systems like a pendulum without friction. And um, yeah, so these are posterior samples. This is uh, this is exactly the variational framework of before. So we have mm -hmm. uh, the Q Z given X, and we want to sample from Q Z given X, and the X is this batch of ECG, real ECGs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a bit shorter this time. Uh, uh, of course, I tried with more. It's it's even more difficult to train. So, I guess the nice thing about these is that you can concatenate them basically, and you get a periodic because they're different from one another. So, if you concatenate a bunch of pulses, then you get a longer <laughs> time series mm, without having okay. to train directly. Uh, so, this is your X, and this is your sample from uh, QZ given X. And you see that I mean they're similar. They're different enough from one another. So. Uh, good for data augmentation. This would be yeah. already usable, I think, for data augmentation. Similar enough. Um, yeah, not, nothing more to say. So f future stuff that we couldn't fit uh, in the timeline. Um, uh, well, yeah, 
the, the interpretable latent stuff, basically, uh, with uh, ECGs coming from different uh, states of the patient and conditioning on them, like checking that they actually recover uh, some. Uh, we did check, uh, there's not a lot, there's basically no work actually on, on this, on trying to identify uh, what features change from ECGs mm -hmm. in a patient that's doing something or something else. So we don't have any like, medical expertise to do it ourselves. So it, it would be, it would need to be done all end to end with some kind of general metric and uh, it, I think it's a long work. The other thing is uh, classic TSTR, test mm -hmm. uh, train on synthetic test in real for like ECG classification or uh, segmentation. This was the next step with uh, this this one, the, the last right, one. Right, right. Uh, so it's going to be the, the next step. And we also, we had pre-processed this, uh, took a lot of time actually, mimicry <laughs> waveform. Uh, it's uh, huge and uh, we decided to find a smaller data set because uh, these are like iterating through these models is already difficult with that data mm -hmm. set and this one is it's got its own problems so we can talk about but it's really big uh, this this would be the the big data set for like the final the ultimate right. experiment mm -hmm. I guess it's nice there's also a subset of this that's synced with uh, MIMIC3 uh, so they have patient IDs that are synced. So one could do mm -hmm. something like ICU mortality prediction exactly. uh, with this stuff and uh, like EESTR, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all I have you know, some info here. If there's any, like parameter sizes and training, how much, how long it takes to train if there's some interest and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Uh, it's an interesting work. Actually, it's a pretty, pretty nice work i'm interested in actually i was always interested in generating sequence data, data set but not exactly like time series data sets like ecg but recently a lot of people a lot of like doctors from like seoul national university hospitals or like Asam medical university Asam medical centers they are usually they, they usually ask for consulting for like automatic dialysis scheduling or ventilation scheduling and they always involve time series data like uh, mm -hmm. like blood pressure or, or ECG or that kind of signal so it would be very interesting to further develop this work mm -hmm. uh, yeah yeah and the, it's a great the, work the, I like the like the uh, interpretable I, I think that's that's what most people find find the coolest when they have those sliders that they can visualize mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that would be the final. I don't. Right. I haven't seen that anyway. So, for time series. Yeah, actually, because mimic three, mimic three time series data, they are, as you said, they are connected to the actual mimic three data set. So you can actually extract different categories of patients, like the ones with heart failure, the ones with hypertension, the ones with diabetes, and then you can generate like per patient, you can generate different types of ECGs. So it'll be very. Mm -hmm. It's a nice. It will be a nice touch. Oh, okay. yeah. All right. Uh, any question from the audience? I guess it's a bit of a technical work, especially, especially involving ECGs and neural ODs. So it might not be so easy to ask questions. But if you do have questions, you can always ask on Classum or actually leave a feedback on the evaluation sheet. That would be even nicer. Yeah. Yeah, we went a little overboard uh, regarding the time. So I guess we can finish or about, yeah, it's, it's pretty, yeah, we only got five more minutes. So I guess if there are no more questions, we can end the class today and then move on to team three and team four next, this coming Thursday. All right. So thank you everybody. Um, yeah, I'll see you guys this Thursday. Bye-bye.